depreciation is such an insidious, covert car ownership cost. And here's how you can cut it in half. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. I do have plans for world domination, of course, but COVID-19 2020, what a bastard. Spray liberally, therefore, twice daily with my patented 2020 FO and do what you can in the meantime, of course, to make Australia less shit. Hit me up on the website for that. The new car discount thing in Australia. Not everything else. Do try to keep up. You buy a new car, okay? It depreciates. You can count on that. It's sort of like death and taxes. Kind of like throwing a 50-buck bill out the window every few days, isn't it? And you get nothing back. There's no exchange. All you do is chuck money and your car gets worth less. <laughs> yes. Depreciation, therefore, truly is the sandpaper dildo of car ownership costs. I'm being metaphoric, of course, and if you find that comment somehow offensive, then I suggest you go and take it up with Ryan Reynolds and his six-pack abs, because he said it first in Deadpool, the best R-rated superhero movie of all time. <laughs> Plus, it had Gina Carano, ladies and gentlemen. I'd be making an exception to my blonde mandate there, and I would not want to be the dude who messed with Gina Carano, just saying. Hashtag respect. The truly insidious thing about depreciation is the way it attacks so covertly. You don't actually pay it until the very end of the deal, when your knuckles are turning white and you're waiting for the sales dude to come back with his trade-in offer. You know how this feels. It's obvious you're about to get bent over, right? And the only question is, how hard? Knees or ankles? Again, I am being metaphoric. Hashtag satire. If you had to pay your friggin' depreciation once a week, perhaps in cash at the post office, like if some asshole made that a law, there would be demonstrations in the street. And I'd further suggest that new car sales would fall off a cliff over the perceived injustice. So I've got these three tips for you that will cut the depreciation you ultimately pay in half, inspired by a somewhat disappointed dude named Laurie Howell, who is one of us one of you, whatever. In 2017, partly on the strength of your reviews, we bought a Kia Sorento. It is a wonderful car, silent, economical, packed with features, comfortable, and with enough power to do what you want. We call ours Chester, because it's a bit like driving around in a Chesterfield lounge. Frankly, I do worry about people who name their cars, so definitely one of you, not one of us, I'd suggest. I would never name a car, unless of course it shat itself on me, in the middle of the gaffer outside mobile range. I think there's an exemption in the legislation for that one. However, I recently saw an ad for a second-hand Sorento of the same spec and similar kilometres to ours and noted that it was selling at approximately 60% of what ours cost new. A quick check of other ads and some googling has revealed that the Sorento has one of the highest depreciation rates around interestingly, exceeded only by the CX-9. Dude, ads are a crap way to research prices and values of vehicles. They're all over the place. I mean, dealers are building in huge margins for negotiation. Private sellers with completely unrealistic expectations as to the value of their particular shit heap, they skew the results. I'd suggest that Analysis has to be underpinned by actual solid data. And I use Redbook for that. Redbook.com.au here in Australia. It's free and it's a consistently updated source of decent data. It might be a bit optimistic from time to time, but at least it's consistently optimistic. And you can check the field relative to other entrants 
in a much more robust way. What is behind this high depreciation rate? Has the seven-seater SUV bubble burst? It certainly doesn't seem to be anything about the car itself. In fact, if you want a roomy, comfortable SUV, a second-hand Sorento or CX-9 would have to be a good buy, I would think. Also, with such high depreciation rate, 130 bucks per week by my <laughs> estimation, would we have been better off leasing the vehicle? It seems to me the main factor in this purported high depreciation for Sorento is actually dodgy data. And we will look at the data in just a sec. But no, no bubble bursting here with seven seat SUVs. You gotta remember that used car values are underpinned wholly by supply and demand. And in fact, there's a bubble in used cars generally right at the moment. COVID-19 has caused many new car supply shortages and the knock-on effect of that is that it has reduced the supply of late model used cars in the market because the trade-ins that are associated with those new cars that people are waiting for are delayed. And this has ramped up the value of whatever vestigial used cars are available in the market today. Also worth noting that leasing is not a hedge against depreciation unless you jump into one of those guaranteed future value sort of deals with a manufacturer and those are typically, let's be kind, completely extortionate in terms of the associated aspects, the terms and conditions of the finance contract. There is no free lunch on depreciation and you cannot beat it with finance. So let's crunch the numbers. Okay, so at the risk of trying to be somewhat objective about this and actually getting good data, I went to Red Book and I spent about an hour doing research on seven different seven-seat SUVs. So six from the mainstream and then I thought I'd look at a Q7 as well. And it plays like this. And apologies about the mic too, it's Sunday and I just can't be asked repositioning the boom and looking like a pro. So anyway, we've got the Sorento GT diesel up the top and I've chosen the top of the range models here generally to compare because they're the most popular and they're the ones which will attract the highest resale value. But you're free, of course, to go to Redbook and look for exactly the spec and model that is applicable to your car and its competitors. So anyway, I've got Sorento G GT Diesel, Santa Fe Highlander Diesel, CX-9 Azami all-wheel drive, the Pathfinder TI all-wheel drive, and while we're talking about the Pathfinder, we better do this. Okay, so while we're talking Pathfinder, how about we deal briefly with a dude named Cameron and his Pathfinder problem. We are looking at a second-hand seven-seat SUV. We looked at a 2015 Nissan Pathfinder. It is a front-wheel drive. We like the V6, was a very smooth and had good mid-range take off. This car will be a run around for the wife. We have a bougie of 25 grams. Should we try and find an all-wheel drive pathfinder or should we just get the front-wheel drive? Thank you, John. I did also email you last week on your website. Haven't heard anything from you yet. It may interest you to learn that I have neither the time nor the inclination to edit inbound messages. And of course, sometimes I find them hilarious and at other times I just find them sad and occasionally both. Let me just say to you, if you are a young person and you are watching this report, okay, there is a hell of a lot of talk right now in the world about inequity and privilege. And it seems to me that one discussion we are not having is that we live in a world that rewards disproportionately the most intelligent, articulate and highly educated people. And we are all in this race in the developed world. And I'd suggest that you need to pay attention at friggin' school because you really want to be in the front half of the pack, if possible. You need, at the very least, to be able to spell basic words and use complete sentences competently. And if you cannot do that, it is a lifelong liability. So pay attention. At least, that's how it seems to me. And to Cameron now, in my estimation, Pathfinder is one of the market's enduring shit heaps. 
Consumer Reports named it one of the top 20 worst cars in, I think it was 2015, but essentially the same model of Pathfinder is on sale today. And as I understand it, very little has changed. Former Nissan boss Carlos Ghosn has actually been reported to march into the JATCO head office, metaphorically, and heads rolled over the reliability of the Pathfinder and other JATCO CVT transmissions, if memory serves. All the automotive news agencies covered this event, and I'm sure Google can confirm it for you if you would like to look. JATCO, of course, makes the Pathfinder transmission, and the company is 75% Nissan-owned, so it's an in-house problem. Every other seven-seat SUV, seemingly, would be a better choice than a Pathfinder, at least in my view. My advice there is do not do this to yourself. You do not deserve it. Let somebody else inflict a Pathfinder on them. You don't have to do it. Also, I'd suggest that I'm one of the very few motoring journalists out there who tries to help ordinary punters. I make myself available for this and I spend more than one day every week personally responding to this and that and I don't get anything out of it except a warm, fuzzy feeling that journalism can actually be a vector for good as well as evil. But the sheer volume of inbound communications from time to time means that I just don't get to everyone, okay? And I have to do triage and preference mission-critical inquiries, right? Because I have mouths to feed as well and mortgages to pay and all of that enjoyable stuff. So if I do not get to you, I am quite sorry about that, but it's kind of unavoidable. So with that out of the way and Nissan hating me again for and telling the truth about their product. Uh, we've also got the Pajero Sport Exceed, which I admit is not the same thing, but it's another data point. Really good value, great entry price point, but it's a hardcore SUV, like all-terrain capable and heavy tow compatible as well, which the others, frankly, are not. So there's that. And we've got Kluger Grande all-wheel drive in case you wanted to drive a lounge room all the way around the country. And the Q7 Auto Quattro. And what I've done is I've taken the recommended retail price of these vehicles. So that would be not including on-road costs, which vary from dealer to dealer because the dealer delivery fee is kind of, you know, negotiable and infinitely variable, therefore, and also because the state-by-state -state registration charges change as well. So this is a more holistic way of looking at these vehicles in the market right around Australia. And what I've done is, of course, there's two different ways you can dispose of your vehicle. The most common way is the T for trade-in, because, hey, you're at the dealership, you're getting a new car, you're getting rid of your old one, super convenient to trade it in, but you do take a hit. And there is an alternative. You can sell your car, P for privately. And you'll see that in this sort of, you know, cars that were worth about 60 grand on the showroom floor three years ago, there's about $6,000 difference if you're willing to cop the inconvenience on the chin and sell privately. But of course, there are pros and cons with that, which we'll get to. Anyway, you can see that the retained value, if you're trading in, is about 60% for the Sorento GT diesel. And that's broadly in line with these other vehicles, which vary from about 50 to 60 something percent in terms of the trade-in and up to about 70% in terms of a private sale. But what I'm suggesting here and what the data absolutely shows is that there is not some sort of black hole that Sorrento has fallen into. Interestingly, the worst performer here that just jumps off the page at me is Santa Fe Highlander Diesel from 2017. These are all 2017 models like Laurie was doing his alleged research on. Uh, that's probably because they changed the shape in 2019 and the new Santa Fe that resulted from that model launch in 2019 is just so much better looking and so much better in every respect that it's really taken uh, the, the older one back, right? The older model, the superseded model always takes a big hit on depreciation if they launch a new one that is substantially better. And I think that's what the data shows here with Santa Fe. And I suggest it's gonna to happen to Sorrento too because the new one's only just been launched within a couple of weeks of producing this video. So 
we can expect that as that filters through into the market, the older one is going to take a hit simply because the newer one is better. So there's that. I expected the Q7 to be far worse as well because they do have a reputation, the brand and that car I thought would depreciate more heavily, but it is certainly much more expensive to own in a dollars per week sense, right, than all of the others. But you'd expect that because it's a premium product and depreciation is proportional to age to some extent. So if you pay much more for the vehicle up front, you're going to be paying more each week for the depreciation compared with a cheaper, more affordable, whatever, mainstream vehicle. And just to lay this out so you get it completely dialed in, these are trade-in and private prices from redbook.com.au and I have taken the numeric average of the range. And Redbook stipulates that its prices are estimates based on average Ks for vehicles in average condition. So if yours is low Ks and significantly better than average in terms of its overall condition, then hey, you will attract a somewhat higher price, but not unrealistically higher. And I think as a seller, what you've always got to do is battle against this sort of default presumption that your car is so good that it's worth so much more than the market is prepared to pay. Ultimately, you don't decide what it's worth. The market does. And then you have to go, oh, yeah, fair enough. Or you have to just see then, then <laughs> withdraw the vehicle from sale. The retained value here, you can see broadly that across all of this uh, these span of vehicles, there's about 10% greater value realizable if you sell privately, but it can be a pain in the ass. And the depreciation cost per week, you would absolutely not be happy fronting up at the post office and handing over, I don't know, 150, 170 bucks a week, 190 bucks a week in the case of the Pathfinder, you would absolutely not be happy handing that over once a week because for some people, that's going to cost more than the fuel. The next thing I really wanted to do here was to make sure that there wasn't a seven-seat SUV bubble that had burst. In other words, I wanted to make sure that Sorento's result was typical of other categories in the market and the market more broadly, all right? So what I did was I arbitrarily chose a compact sort of small car and a medium-sized SUV. And these are both popular segments as well. So how do they perform, right? And I chose premium versions of both of those. Specifically, the Sorento is here. This is the same data as on the previous page, but we've added i30 SR dual clutch transmission. So that's the i30 premium sort of spec with the performance power plant and all of that stuff, okay? And uh, it was about 34,000 bucks, but you can see we're still in that 60 to mid 70s retain value price range. And what's important here are the percentages because this is obviously only about half the cost of the Sorento, so you would expect it to cost you less per week. But the percentages, I'd suggest, very similar indeed. And then I chose the Mazda CX-5 Akira diesel as a medium SUV that's quite aspirational and it's got very similar retained value as well. I think you'd agree. So the Sorento, there's no evidence that the Sorento is a depreciation disaster. And hey, I've got no vested interest in one way or the other, it being a disaster or not, but the data is what the data is. And it seems to be representative of seven seat SUVs generally and the market more broadly. So then what I did was I thought about what strategies can you possibly deploy to minimize depreciation? And one obvious strategy here is you could get a discount up front because only a mug walks into a car dealer and goes, oh, okay, I'll pay that. You know, there's negotiation and you have to be a bit of a hard ass about it. And if you are, I'd suggest this is a major hedge against depreciation because at trade-in time, you know, nobody comes up and says to you, well, what did you pay for that car? All they're concerned about is what is that car and what is it worth today? So if you get a discount up front, then that discount is reflected in the percentage of retained value. So I'd suggest that in cars of this nature up at about that 60000 buck price point, 
you're a mug if you don't get at least 5,000 bucks off. You should aim for between 10 and 15% as a discount, I think. That's reasonable. The margin's there to support that. If the dealer says, well, our recommended driveway price is X, you should take off between 10 and 15%, whatever's convenient to round down to a whole number and say, well, I'm not prepared to pay you more than round it off whole number. Okay, And if you do that and you walk away with $5,000 off, look at how it pumps up the retained value from 60% at trade-in time with the same trade-in offer, 35.6 in both cases. But you are 10% better off on your trade-in offer just by getting that five grand discount up front. And if you want to amortize that across the three years that you've owned the car in 2020, because you bought it back there in 2017, then I'd suggest you know you go from 150 bucks a week down to 118. And if you are handing that over at the post office once a week, then it's easier to hand over 120 odd bucks than it is to hand over 150, especially as you're getting nothing in exchange. And a similar uh, set of circumstances is represented in the private sale proposition, right? You're about 30 bucks a week better off, okay, from a private sale point of view, and about 30 bucks a week better off from a trade-in point of view. The discount up front is critical, is the point I'm making. The other thing you could do, of course, is you could just own the car a little bit longer, because the quicker you turn your car around, the more of a hit you're gonna take on depreciation, all right? So let's have a look at the comparable car, okay, from 2015, which would be a Sorento Platinum Diesel, they called it back then. It was 55,990, brand new, recommended retail price once again. And if you own that car for two years longer, obviously the retained value is gonna be less, okay? It's definitely gonna be less but look at the weekly ownership cost. In the case of a private sale, you're no longer spending 100 bucks a week at the post office, right? So owning the car for just two years longer is really going to help in the context of what the depreciation costs you over time on a per week basis, if you like. And the final thing you could do is you could combine both of these strategies. You know, you could negotiate hard up front for your $5,000 discount and you could own the car for an extra two years. And look what happens when you do that. This is a 2015 model of the same car, essentially, with a five grand discount. And now, in the private sale sense, you're down to an ownership cost per week of just 72 bucks or a trade-in time, 97. And I don't know about you, but... 150 bucks a week to own a car for three years or 97 bucks a week to own it for five. Still going to be reasonably current, reasonably low Ks for most people over five years. The average car in Australia drives about 15,000 Ks a year. That's when we don't have a global pandemic and we're locking the population down and discouraging travel. All right, so over five years, five fifteens is you know, 75,000 Ks. Even if you're above average and you drive 100,000 Ks, it's still pretty new and still under warranty, okay? So there's that. And of course, in the private sales sense, you're down from 110 bucks a week for three years down to 72 bucks. And all you've got to do is get a discount up front, okay, and own the car for two years longer. So if you are concerned about depreciation, and I'd suggest you should be, because it is a major ownership cost, and you are not completely afloat here and at the mercy of the market, there are things you can do, okay? There are hacks, and the three hacks are in reverse order of attractiveness, at least to me. Number three is sell the car privately, because if you sell privately, it's gonna realize in that first example, about $6,000 more. There are some dark sides to doing that, though, particularly in a pandemic, I think you'd agree. The, the first one, obviously, is hands up, who wants a bunch of strangers coming to your place and rubbing their hands all over the interior of your car? I vote, not me, you know? I vote not going for a drive with these people. <laughs> but even if they're perfectly COVID free and uh, hey, even if we don't have a pandemic, do you really want to sell privately? Because it's a pain in the ass. The unique selling proposition of a trade-in is 
convenience, right? You just go there and they handle everything. They pay out the old finance if there's still a finance contract pertaining and they give you some money towards the purchase of the new car and for many people that is good enough, okay? But if you want the most money, you have to sell privately. However, if you're an old person or if you are vulnerable for some other reason, let's say you're a woman living alone, do you really want a bunch of people, some of whom could potentially be criminal scumbags, just coming to your house allegedly to check out your car that you've got for sale, but really to canvas your availability for victimhood in the commission of their crime. I know I don't want to do that. And if you are vulnerable like that, perhaps you have uh, an adult child who can be there to handle that for you. If you're elderly or a woman living alone, perhaps you can do all the inspections at your place of work during business hours instead of out of work hours at home. These are probably things that you'd like to consider. But for some people, it will be unnecessarily risky to go off and go through this private sale process. And if that's you, then you will have to cop the difference in value on the chin, obviously. You can also just own the car for longer. And we discussed that, that's easy to do, right? Just hang on to it for another two years. It's gonna still be reasonably current. Safety systems, reasonably current. Performance, reasonably current. Reliability, still okay. I mean, five years, it's still kind of a baby, maybe an adolescent, maybe an early adult, but certainly not a geriatric like me. And number one, with a bullet, the easiest thing to do is just get a discount up front. The bigger the discount up front, the more you kick depreciation's ass at the end of the deal. It's that simple. And my advice for you there is just be a bit of a hard ass. I mean, a lot of people live in this world where they need to be friends with everyone, <laughs> even the dude selling them a car. And I'd suggest you really don't need that. So you can be polite, diplomatic, conversationally polite, but also a bit of a hard ass when it comes to your own commercial best interests. There's nothing wrong with you saying to a car salesman, no, the maximum amount I am prepared to pay for this car is X. Take it or leave it. So do you need to go and talk to somebody higher up like the dealer principal or the sales manager? Because that's the offer and if you want to sell, it's on the table until I walk out the door. And you might be flat out fascinated how malleable the price becomes if you just stick to your guns. It is difficult for some people to do that, but not only do you get the discount up front, but you also kick depreciation's ass. And I'd suggest, isn't that the main thing? A car's a thing, it costs you money, it gives you tremendous liberty when there's no lockdown, and all you've got to do is pay for it, all right? You do have an obligation to yourself and your own financial interests to minimise those costs. And baby, that's how you beat depreciation.